Hi everybody, this is Mr. Scott and I'm going to give you a little lesson on basic fire behavior. Emily Richardson, who is a trainer for the Washington Department of Natural Resources, gave me this slideshow during some professional development just a, a few months ago. And she trains and she talks about um, basic fire behavior in, from the perspective of a forest fire fighter. And of course, we know, we know what this is. This is the fire triangle, and we've talked about it a bunch of times. It's just fire, that, that chemical reaction needs to have oxygen, heat, and fuel. If you take either one of those away, then we don't have that um, chemical reaction. All right, let's look at oxygen first. We always think that ox the oxygen we breathe is 100% um, oxygen. Well, it's not. It's mostly nitrogen. And it's only about 21% oxygen, but it, but 16% is all that we need for combustion. So um, we can a fire will start in relatively low percentages of oxygen. All right, in, in forest fires, the secondary source of uh, of heat is either man-made, which we know is about 80% of the time, or even more than that, and then about between 15 and 20 percent of the time it can be something natural like uh, lightning and mostly it is like right the fuel in that in the fire triangle is the grass the shrubs which are the big leafy plants timber which is trees that have fallen slash which is the branches in the broken uh, broken parts of the trunk and leaves and grass and other plants that have died and then there's artificial materials. Could be building materials that are left out or uh, outbuildings or in some cases even houses and communities. All right, when the forest department, our forestry department is fighting fires, they use three ways to suppress the fire. They use water or um, a fire, fire retardant product that they drop from an airplane or helicopter. They, they tamp the fire out or throw dirt on top of it like the, the picture shows in the middle. Or they remove the fuel by digging a trench and keeping it from uh, jumping that trench. And they can actually stop the fire. But these are in really, really low grade fires. If they're, they're big fires, this stuff is really difficult for them to do. All right. Natural and constructed barriers help prevent the spread of the fire by not being able to jump over it. Like on the left-hand side, the lake, the lake provides a real natural barrier to the, to the fire. So if they're fighting a fire, they know that it's not going to go across the lake. So they'll have to trap, they'll have to try and trap it in uh, some other corner or, or put it out some other way. Uh, the constructed barrier like a road you can see the firefighters on one side of the road while the other ones are trying to prevent it from jumping across the road the ones on the other side will put the fire out if it does happen to come across so that constructed barrier is really good it could be a railroad track too or it could be a dam for that matter any any constructed barrier to fire jumping All right let's look at the what would they call the fire environment interactions triangle when forest fire, when forest forestry department people are fighting a fire, they consider three things, and they 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 look at these as factors for the fire behavior: weather, topography, and fuel. And we're going to talk about each one of these subjects individually as we go. First, we're going to talk about topography. Topography is the arrangement of natural and artificial physical features of an area. So. It has to do with um, whether there's rock formations, valleys, pe you know, peaks. And I'm going to go through all of these uh, pieces individually. Um, but you, as you can see, the terrain uh, is, is part of the topography. Also, a dam would be part of the topography or um, a railroad track or a road. All of, anything that has to do with the terrain would be part of topography. So here are the, the four things that really have a major contribution to the behavior of fire. Whether you're, they're in a canyon, which is a, a suppression between two um, hills, 
ridges, chutes, saddles, and natural and constructed barriers. We talked about those just a minute ago. All right, first of all is the saddle. A saddle is a major depression between two either mountains or major hills. You can see this picture right here. It's a, it's a long U shape, right? Well, if there's, this is, this is not a great picture because you don't see the fuel along this line. If this was tree line and there was trees going up this saddle, then anytime there was a fire in the valley, it would just, um, it would be like a blowtorch. It would be um, sucked up through that saddle because there, there would be convection and that gap right there would, um, it would really just suck that, the oxygen right through that. So the fire would just shoot right over the top of that saddle. And if you're a firefighter and you get caught in a saddle, um, it's extremely dangerous because how fast the fire travels. We saw that picture the other day on the video where the tree just seemed like it exploded. Well, that would if that's happening, because of the slope of the terrain here, uh, that fire would travel really fast. So we'll talk a little bit more about the slope in a minute. All right, shoots are very similar to what we just talked about, but they but they are um, usually on steeper terrain. And we're going to talk about again the the slope of a uh, a hill or a slope of a mountain uh, and how that how it affects the fire in a minute. But a shoot is just a small um, example of a saddle but it, it's usually on a steeper uh, steeper terrain like this and you can see how the angle going up to this sap this uh, chute is much steeper than the angle going up the uh, saddle all right then we, now we're going to talk about slope and then we'll talk about aspect and the position on the slope first of all we'll talk about the slope the slope is just simply the angle in which the hill slopes up. The higher the percentage, the steeper the hill. The, at 55%, this fire is going to um, go up a lot faster than on a uh, lower slope. And we are, we're actually going to do, uh, we're going to test this in a lab that we do uh, for this uh, unit at the end of the unit. But as you can see, this is a 55 degree slope, this is a 30 degree slope, and this is a zero slope. So as it goes up, you can see the fire, the size of the fire increases, right? Both the intensity and the speed that it travels. And that's simply because convection, right? If we have convection down here, the heat's going away from the fuel. If we have convection here, it's going a little bit towards the trees. But if we go, if we look at it here, the, uh, the convection is going to go right up the slope. And again, as, as the slope increases, the updraft increases too because the wind follows that updraft up in the slope. All right. Aspect is the cardinal direction towards which the, the slope faces. So if you look at this picture, right, um, the south side of this hill right here has no trees on it. The north-facing side has some has some trees on here's a better example over here it just splits right down the seam right here and the southern slope has nothing on it on the um east i mean on the northern side it's you can see there's a bunch of trees and same with this third one over here so this kind of wave action that's happening right here you'll see the, the southern side the southern exposed side um doesn't have as, as many trees on it now that could be, be because of two things either they don't get enough water or there's been forest fires there that have killed those because forest fires are going to be more prevalent on the south side oh i'm going to get back go back to this for a second uh, the east and west if these if this happens to be a uh a, like a mountain or a, or a steep hill or something um the uh, east and west sides are going to get relatively the same amount of um, heat as each other, right? So as you can see, this the face over here, this is would probably be the west-facing slope, and then the other side would be the east-facing slope. So you're going to get a little bit less sun on the um, east and west, a little less than the south side, but the north-facing side is certainly going to get a lot less uh 
exposure to the sun. Then you're going to get less humidity. You're going to have um, wetter uh, ground on the east facing, I mean, on the north facing uh, slope. All right. So here again, we're back to the fire environment interactions triangle. This is weather, topography, and fuels. All right. Temperature and relative humidity. These two are, these two kind of fight each other. And it's really easy to understand, right? As the temperature goes up, the humidity goes down. As things get hotter, right, the, the water evaporates and it, it leaves the area. As it cools, then uh, the, the, uh, the moisture in the air starts to sink in the air and it comes down to ground level. Okay, so temperature, if you have an increase in the temperature, you, the, you get the humidity rises. And as it, as it cools, it, the humidity goes down. And you can see how these are, are inversely related. Temperature going up, uh, relative humidity goes down. Um, factors that impact temperature and relative humidity. Uh, it, the elevation really makes a difference, right? If you're the higher you are on the mountain, the cooler it's going to get. The cooler you get, the less chance of uh, fire, forest fire. So, the obviously the valleys would be uh, the the extreme opposite of like the mountaintops. Okay, topography and how the how the land is formed makes a big difference on the temperature and humidity. We have south facing. Um, slope, then it's going to be hot and it's going to have a real um, uh, low humidity. If it's a, a north facing slope, it's going to have less humidity and the ground's going to be a lot moister. Right? If we have cloud cover, if we have more cloud cover, we'll have increased humidity. More wind we have in the daytime, you'll see um, the less humidity we have. Proximity to bodies of water. If you're close to water, it's going to be more humid. If you if there's no water near, the, it, you're going to be less humid, right? There's a lot, lot less water evaporating. All right, this is interesting. I, I thought this was an interesting idea that um, when we talk about wind, wind is, is really neat. I mean, if you have a, a windy situation in a fire, it's like the worst case scenario, right? Uh, we, we, when we're feeding that oxygen or we're fanning the flames, it increases the uh, intensity of the fire. So I, it was interesting when they talked about this because during the day, the wind actually lowers the air temperature. And that's what's kind of obvious, right? When we're sitting outside and it, um, when the wind blows, it lowers the temperature. But it, and it also raises the humidity in the daytime, right? But it's still... It, it creates a blowtorch kind of situation because the, the oxygen that's carried there fans the flames and it allows um, the fire to travel um, horizontally along the ground a lot easier when the wind is blowing it. So instead of the flames going convecting straight up, if you have wind, it's going to push it left or right or whatever direction the wind's going and it's going to catch that stuff that, that's next to the tree is on fire. At nighttime, the wind keeps the air temperature warmer because it's moving, and it lowers the humidity, which is pretty odd to me. I thought I, I thought that um, it would be the same as uh, during the day, but that's absolutely not true. It lowers the humidity. All right. So when firefighters are talking about this, the fire behavior triangle, they have a, a, a this whole concept of alignment. And alignment simply means when all three of these factors uh, are, are in a line, that means they are all feeding the, the probability of the fire um, increasing its intensity. Or if they're out of alignment, it kind of slows those down. Think about, you know, if, if the topography is there and the fuels are there, but it's raining, it's you're going to have less fire than if the, the rain wasn't there. If you had, you know, the fuels and topography were leading them, lending themselves to a fire, um, but there was wind and it was dry, of course, you'd have a, a huge fire 
uh, probability and an increased uh, speed of travel for the for the fire. We saw this video on the era of mega fire, so I'm not going to talk about that. But he's he just talks about how humans have really uh, done a disservice to the forest service by allowing the trees to grow and putting out the fires because now we have this fuel source where the trees are stacked in next to each other like a green carpet. And when they go up, they go up hard and fast. All right. So how can we affect the fire behavior triangle before uh, the fire starts? Well, the Forest Service has changed their opinions about how they're, how they're trying to deal with this. They want to do what's called fuel mitigation, and that means they want to remove parts of the fuel source in the forest and make it less easy for the fire to travel really, really quick. And they call those prescribed fires, right? Or the second, second way of doing that is mechanical thinning, actually going in there with machines and thinning the trees in the, in the underbrush. All right, the pros and cons of mechanical thinning. Obviously, the pros are that there's no smoke, there's no risk of fire escape, and there's no prescri prescription window, meaning there's uh, no window that you have to worry about when you do it because the weather doesn't matter. It still does because your heavy, heavy equipment can cause sparks, which, will, which could cause a forest fire. But in, um, in comparison to a, a prescribed fire, there's or little or no prescription window. The cons are that it doesn't remove all of the hazardous fuels. It doesn't always reduce the fuels, um, and it's it, it sometimes it uh, not it doesn't even fulfill the natural role of the ecosystem. And and so if you think about it, when, when there's a fire, a lot of the insects are killed that are uh, nasty little bugs, right? In this particular case, when humans do the thinning, they can't they can't get rid of those, and so. Lots of the fuel is left on the uh, floor of the uh, forest, and it, it doesn't take away all of the probability for the fire. Let's talk about prescribed fires. The pros are that um, it creates a fire-adapted ecosystem, meaning once the fire comes through, it kills all of the vegetation, but there's all of these seeds that are protected underneath. So when the fire is put out, all of those seeds start to compete. And then you have biodiversity, which meaning means simply just a bunch of different kind of live um, organisms start to grow. So you have diversity in the plants that grow instead of just dominant plants growing in there. Um, it tends to be more effective at removing hazardous fuel. So more of the uh, fuel is burned off the uh, floor of the forest and it tends to be more cost effective meaning it's cheaper when we burn stuff off than bringing heavy equipment in and having to do that the cons are that it creates smoke right there's no smoke created from mechanical removal of um, the, the forest fuels so the smoke is a problem and it's a political problem right nobody wants to have smoke in their uh, in their communities um, it can it can be done poorly. So if they don't do a really good job of it, they put it, the fire out too quickly, or they don't, they, or they let it burn too much, it could be it could cause problems, right? There's a um, a possibility of the fire escaping into the and turning into a wildfire as well. Um, sometimes that that these burns don't meet the objectives. Again, they don't burn enough, or they burn too much, and um, it it can cause a hazardous situation. All right, and of course, there's the narrow implementation window that you don't want to burn in the middle of August when it's super dry. You have to wait, and you don't want to do it during the winter when it's raining because you, your prescribed burn won't won't um, do the job. So there's a very narrow window of days that you can actually do this. Now let's talk about fire-adapted ecosystems, right? The, the problem about... Uh, putting out all the forest fires is that when we don't have forest fires, we have dominant species. Um, in, in Western Washington, um, we have what are called Douglas fir trees, and they are the dominant um, organism in the forest. When they are left unchecked and they're, they're allowed to survive at a higher rate, they out, they out 
produce anything else that's around it. So we end up with having this uh, these forests with very uh, few species of trees and plants in them because the Douglas fir just um, it, it it robs all the sunlight and from all the other plants and uh, it survives at a higher rate. So uh, it, it doesn't lead itself to have very good biodiversity, especially if the trees are the same height because that shade uh, created from the tree limbs um, just gr grows straight up. If you have trees that are at different heights, the, the sunlight can get through them. So it's a really huge problem. We have these huge stands of trees that are all relatively the same age. And that's what happens when we log off um, areas and then plant trees right afterwards. We get most of the trees are all the same age instead of you know, there are tr traditional historic fires that kill some of the trees and not some the other ones. So they, you would have um, multiple um, heights of trees. All right, the role of prescribed fires in the environment. Prescribed um, fires do a, several things. It helps create a nutrient cycle. Again, when we have biodiversity, when things can grow, multiple things can grow, you have better food for the wild animals. Um, it... it the fire also stimulates some of the seeds. Some seeds need fire to have their shells open up and the, the seeds to uh, start to germinate. Uh, prescribed fires control invasive species like termites and ants and um, some types of bees. Kill, kills some of these pests, right? And rodents for that matter, all right? It creates a complex ecosystem. We already said that kind of when we were talking about the nutrient cycle. Um, it, it prevents the encroachment of less uh, fire adaptive na native species. So um, all in all, uh, the role of fire is really, really important in the forest. And we, again, we've been putting out fires for 50 years and not allowing it to happen. So uh, these, what fire does is, is actually a problem now because we're not allowing it to happen. All right, here's two pictures of, of the same field, um, one before a prescribed burn and then one after. It's easy to see that on the right-hand side, there's many different species. And this was taken in the same month on a typical day. And it, and it seems like it was pretty much pretty close to the same weather happening. So you see the diversity on the right-hand side. All right, here's just an aerial picture of a prescribed fire. This is the before picture you can see, and then it'll, it'll show you the after picture. Here's the burn off, okay? And that was a controlled fire. They used the constructed barriers of a road to help prevent the spread of that fire. And of course that increases the diversity. All right, so this is just a picture of um, the, the steps you know, the prior to the burn up in the right-hand side, the guys are starting to set the fire. You can see the grass growing there. You can see the prescribed fire growing. What it does is it burns a lot of the, around the tree. And we would think that it would kill this tree, but this heavy bark on these trees prevents it from um, killing the tree. It just kills the grass around it, increasing the diversity of that. But it does. what it does is it burns up the tree and burns off the little pieces of um, branch, dead branches that are there. And, and it kind of uh, reduces the probability of a fire just by doing that. And then down in the lower left-hand corner, you can see after the prescribed fire, and you can see that the ground cover is pretty much burned up. And then the diversity that um, of, of the growth that happens afterwards. So anyway, uh, this is, um, this is all the positive, the pros and cons of uh, prescribed fires. And, and we saw how the uh, interaction between the three factors that contribute to the behavior of a fire are weather, topography, and fuels. Thank you.